Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and happy, gosh, I have to look at the calendar. Happy July 19th, and welcome to the Chicagoland SharePoint Users Group Virtual Session. I'm your host, Mark Vogt, uh, SharePoint Practice Lead with MTech Consulting, but we have a number of additional guest speakers today. Uh, it's a midsummer kind of lazy, in-between conferences sort of session. We had a chance to dive really deep into a bunch of other topics earlier in the spring, even in the early summer. We overlooked a couple of new technologies, new applications from Microsoft, and today we're going to try to circle around and offer up and include those uh, demos on those technologies in today's session. Let me jump in and advance my slides. Today's agenda, our understanding SharePoint's purpose, always, 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 as people roll in, I see we've only got a handful of attendees, but we've got uh, well over a dozen people that are expected to come today. Lessons learned from fellow members is a brand new We've got people that are interested in actually sharing not only lessons that they've learned, but they're opening up discussions. And that's exactly what this users group is supposed to be about. Michael Blumenthal is uh, going to be here to talk about recent news and upcoming events. The order might switch there uh, as well. And then we dive into cool new stuff. As time permits, uh, we go into demos. And lastly, bring your own problems, which is uh, that filler topic if we, if we need it. While people are rolling in, I want to spend a number of slides talking about big picture stuff. We've seen this slide, the four stages of collaboration maturity. In the middle has always been this one called tasking, but we've always paid attention recently to, to step number one, communicating, step number two, sharing. Tasking is really what I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about. What does this really mean when you're getting into collaboration and you're really starting to to dig in deep and mature, you're going to be addressing this topic of tasking. Tasking is the capturing, assigning, and tracking of actual tasks related to collaboration efforts. It's not messages. It's absolutely not emails. It's not conversations. It's not generic items. You have to start treating tasks as actual objects. The same way a message is a message, a task is a task. It represents the beginning of truly mature collaboration. You have to understand that not everything is a message. Messages are not tasks, they're messages. Conversations are not tasks, they're conversations. Issues are not tasks, risks are not tasks, but they do resolve and mitigate things. Tasks do mitigate, resolve issues and mitigate risks. Deliverables themselves are not tasks, but tasks actually create deliverables. Only tasks are tasks, and getting everybody to realize that is a fundamental part of taking this next step in collaboration maturity. The structure for a better task. Out of the box, the Microsoft task is a good start, but it's only that, just a good start. There's some additional um, fields that really we've learned over 15 years of use that are so fundamental, so important, they need to be included. So what you should be doing is defining an enhanced content type that includes a condition field that gives you colors, green, yellow, orange, red. It's like a flag that you get to throw on any individual task. It's not gonna automatically throw because it's a project late or it's behind budget, something like this. It's just a condition, you get to throw it. The status actually gives you where that task is in the life cycle of a typical task. It's queued up, it's active, it's pending, it's completed. Those are the normal life cycle steps or statuses, but there's also two alternatives. It's been deferred or hey, it's even been canceled. These are very useful statuses that tell somebody a lot in a very short amount of time about a given task. Prioritizing is a choice field that needs to be added, but it needs to be done correctly. There's A, there's B, there's C, and don't overthink it. If it's A, it must be completed within a day. If it's B, complete it within one week. If it's C, there is no completed date, as time permits. You're just capturing it, getting it out there. Due date, don't see really any need to, to change it, but don't go crazy and use time. Description and notes fields are two very important fields. What we've done that's worked very well for over a decade is that the description field is a memo that's filled with rich text. That means you can put everything in there, images, links, everything to capture all the details that's needed by the actor to actually perform the task. Nothing else goes in the description field. It's what the task needs to be. The assigned to best practice is that there's only one individual actor, and we'll talk about that in another slide. The percent complete is always great, but it leads to not being able to see things very easily. Create a com percent complete bar in there. Use the formula that's specified here 
and you get sort of a poor man's uh, histogram that shows visually on the page how far along that particular gap can. Finally, there's notes. You treat a brand new notes field as if it's a log file for that particular task, and you can work backwards in time. You'll see the sample that's listed there that Kevin Anderson completed it to 100%, but before that, he began work. And before that, Mark actually created the task and assigned it to Kevin Anderson. Everything you wanted to know about that task is trapped inside, is captured inside that one content that very, very elegantly, very efficiently, and therefore very powerfully. Let's look at some other things. Here's a handful of tips that we've learned. Define your tasks in a very specific way. You put goals in a goal list, deliverables in a deliverables list. You put issues and risks in their own issues and risks list. They are not tasks. The tasks go in the task list, and they will address a goal, create a deliverable, resolve an issue, mitigate a risk. But they are their tasks unto themselves. What you want to do then is define that task only starting off with an action verb to start, typically in uppercase letters. You're going to build something, create something, investigate or contact. Then the rest, the predicate of that sentence, you're going to describe that task using the following four characteristics. It has to be atomic. In other words, it's not two things that you're trying to do with that task. It's one thing. It, has, it cannot be subdivided. It has to be succinct. And as you guys all know, that's the hardest thing in Mark Vogt's life is to be succinct. Unambiguous. There can be no confusion or doubt about what is assigned what needs to be done, and that's what the description field gives you. Lastly, it has to be measurable. The way that you word it, it has to be readily decided if the task is completed or not completed. If you can do those four things, and a lot of times this is how requirements are defined, this is how business needs are defined, to be atomic, succinct, unambiguous, and measurable, you'll find out that your tasking becomes very, very effective very, very quickly. Let's look at some examples. We've got keep the task description field this is tip number two, rather. Keep the description field separate from the task notes field in your record. You'll notice that the description field has images in it. It can even have links in it. Everything you need to know to explain the task to the actor. But the, the, the notes field is nothing but a running log, almost a description or a discussion if you want. But it just helps somebody know what's been going on with that particular task. And it ends up being a very clean format. People will use it because they're not overthinking, you're not asking a lot out of them. Tip number three, only assign one single person to own that task. There should be only one owner. There can be numerous contributors. There should be only one neck in the noose. That's how you get stuff done, is by making one individual person responsible. You can later do, you find out that having a single person or the assigned to, excuse me, also sets the stage for grouping and filtering. If you made that a multi, value field, that's not possible. So making it a single value field actually empowers you to do filtering and grouping, and that's actually very, very useful. Tip number three, assign a priority or due date to each task. Go one way, go the other. More often than not, there are times when things don't have due dates. Use the ABC, get everybody to buy into that, what ABC means. Um, the due date helps you break a tie whenever there's two tasks that have the same priority. The soon as due date just wins in a tie. And that's true, it can be very useful. But don't force yourself to always come up with due dates. There's lots of things that are done as time permits and you just gotta keep it on the radar. Tip number five, keep all the details in the task and in the task list. No email threads, no verbal conversations unless that information is copied and pasted back inside the notes field of that particular task. The result is gonna be that the task list becomes a dashboard for that effort, for that project. And the entire project site becomes a veritable knowledge base for the entire project. Anyone can roll on and find out anything about that particular project at any point in time simply by searching the site. Why? Because you've taken the time to aggregate everything about the tasks that make up that effort all into one site, everything. Nobody has to go looking for emails, things like that. Tip six, broken up into three pieces. Set up daily summary alerts for all the relevant actors. Keep everybody in the know with a single daily one that goes out at 11 p.m. Uh, set up immediate alerts when there's a new item that's assigned to a person. You can set these up so everybody gets it. There's no ambiguity. Hey, I didn't get it. I don't know I had to work on it. Hey, you got an alert the moment it actually was defined. Also, consider using Outlook connections for those who use Outlook constantly. Only works for Outlook desktop clients. It doesn't work for the web client, which I think is actually crazy for Microsoft. Everybody's moving over to the cloud, they're moving to browsers, 
why they don't make this work for the Outlook web client drives me crazy. But those are some additional tips. I think the last one is aggregate all your assigned tasks across all your projects using the query web parts, either content or the content, sorry, either the content query web part or the content search web part can actually get the job done. One of them is real time, but it's not fast. The other one is fast, but it's not in real time. Use whatever is work, working with you. Why would you want to do this? You can add this web part to your corporate homepage, and the result will be that you're going to help everyone in your organization answer the question, what am I supposed to be doing? A lot of times we're all in multiple projects in multiple places, and this ends up being an extraordinary mechanism for breaking all of the conversations in email, all the notes in, tap, in, in meetings, things like this, down into what you're supposed to be doing. Action verb, predicate, priority, condition, you're making it as simple, as succinct as possible and getting everybody all on the same playbook. What you'll end up seeing then, here's an example of our Office 365 environment with um, a content query web part, searching for all of the A-level tasks assigned to Mark Vote or assigned to me rather, that if my colleague Stan looks at it, if my he sees all of Stan's tasks, if Kevin looks at it, they're Kevin's tasks, they're only the A-levels and they're all sorted by the soonest due date. So you work from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. You're done with your email. You're wondering what to do next. Go into this. Look at the very top left. Preparing the project work plan is what's next for Mark. Preparing the estimate for a micro SOW for Sky Technologies is what's next for Mark. You drive ambiguity out of your organization. You're driving out time wasted. You're increasing efficiencies. And that's what learning how to use tasking can actually do for your organization. The big picture, all your task lists become dashboards. You can see that here an individual project task list is actually driven by the goals, by the risks, and by the deliverables. There's a traceability that says everything that I'm doing is for a purpose. I'm mitigating a risk, I'm trying to create a project deliverable, or I'm trying to arrive at some kind of a project goals. And that too increases efficiency by driving out ambiguity in what everybody is doing. Diving into news events, I only had a couple of things uh, that needed to, I think everybody's present now. Thanks for coming. Um, I saw on the radar, we still got September and October, our Ignite and SB TechCon. So what we're going to do next is segue over to Michael Blumenthal. Thank you, Mark. Yep, you're welcome, Mike. Handing over to you. Let me know if, uh, I'll tell you if we can, when we can see your slides. Okay. How about now? They're showing up. Yep, very nice. Great. Okay. Welcome, everyone. I have some news and announcements for uh, for Office 365 and some upcoming events. I'm Michael Blumenthal. I'm a Microsoft Office 365 MVP. Uh, just got reawarded for the third third year, so I'm very very pleased about that. But let's get okay. going into the new, uh, into the upcoming events. So as Mark said, Ignite is one of them, but there's a lot of other things happening before then. Uh, first of all, Craig Janke is having a data governance meetup on July 27th. So that's on meetup.com uh, if you want to go to that. We have the Office 365 Adoption User Group. Uh, it is August 3rd, and uh, that's the user group I co-lead. And we will be talking about the Service Health Dashboard and Enterprise Search. We've got uh, two presenters from Microsoft uh, who are actually part of the product team for the Service Health Dashboard in Office 365 uh, talking to us. And then we have Don Miller from BA Insight talking to us about Enterprise Search. So please go and register for that. Uh, and if you can join us in person in Downers Grove, that would be great. Uh, like this user group, though, we do offer a virtual attendance as well. That conference, which is a software development conference for uh, any software platform that you care to, it's vendor agnostic, polyglot, as they say, uh, is uh, at the, at, in Wisconsin Dells at the Kalahari Water Resort, August 7th to 9th. I will be there in the Microsoft area showing off the uh, my Raspberry Pi and how it runs Windows 10 IoT Core. Um, so if you're interested in that, that conference.com. Visual Studio hey, Live. Man? Yep. Do you think there, do you think there are still openings there at the hotels and stuff? And uh, uh, would it make sense at the town hard to take your kids with and let them? Uh, uh, enjoy that, the that's water a great park point. So, so that conference actually does have a family track. So uh, there's a ticket. There's a, 
Okay, I think it's a five hundred dollar or so five five to six hundred dollar ticket for you, the software developer. But if you want to bring your 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 spouse and kids, they can get in for fifty bucks a piece. And there's uh, family activities, um, family sessions, family oriented. Uh, like teach your kids to code, get them to play with robotics, all these things, uh, sessions throughout the three conference, uh, as well as a pig roast and a water park party. Uh, now hotels in, in uh, rooms in the uh, Kalahari are um, limited supply. I think the ones that are left are like 259 and up, uh, but there are other uh, hotels in the area that uh, uh, you can also stay at. Um, so that that's that conference. Um, Visual Studio Live is coming to Chicago uh, at the end of September, and then the following week, Ignite, as you mentioned, Mark, comes to Orlando. Uh, Ignite is Microsoft's premier technical education conference uh, for, I'd say, I believe the last two years, many of the sessions, probably more than, ha more than half of the sessions, have been Office 365 related. Uh, then come in, uh, in October, uh, we're having a, a speaker on OneNote uh, come to the Office 365 Adoption User Group. And again, you can register for that at that same URL uh, on Meetup. Um, and then November 1 is the uh, Col Collab 365 Global Conference. This is an online conference, and uh, they've got sessions for 24 hours straight on November 1st. Um, so and so that, that you can, if you being Collab 365 Global Conference, you'll find it. I think it's collab365.events. Um, and then in December, there's SharePoint Fest. And then, uh, Mark, you mentioned uh, SP TechCon as well uh, in the November timeframe. Um, what were the, Mark, what were the dates for SP TechCon? Uh, let's see, November 2017, November 12th through the 15th in Washington, D.C. There That's you go. a great time to be in Washington. <laughs> the um so so uh, I, a lot of things to do between now and the end of the year go to as many of these things as you can uh and then finally if you want to join my mailing list i will occasionally uh send out uh, newsletters telling people about upcoming events such as these um and uh the bit the bitly links are case sensitive so be careful of the capitalization Moving along to other events, the Microsoft had their worldwide partner conference called Inspire recently. So this is not for customers, this is for Microsoft partners like MTech and other firms. And there are a couple of announcements that they made. Uh, one of them was about Office 365 Business Premium. Um, and so if you're familiar with the range of different Office 365 licenses, this one is targeted to the smaller organizations up to 300 seats. So Generally, I think of this as a lower level license than our E3 and E5 licenses, but um, they uh, announced some interesting applications for that, which are not available to E3 and E5. Uh, in particular, uh, they announced something called Connections, which is an email marketing tool. Uh, they announced Listings, which is, lets you manage your Bing, Facebook, Google, and Yelp listings for your company. They announced an invoicing uh, solution so you can get paid. They announced uh, MileIQ, which is a, choir, a company they acquired, which does mileage expense ma uh, management. And they brought that all together in something they call the Business Center. And so the business premium license is 12 and a half or 15 bucks a month, depending on whether you buy monthly or annually. Uh, but uh, I'm very tempted to uh, see about getting a, a license uh, and a business premium license to add on to our E3 uh, licenses here. Um, at the broadcast media company that I work uh, work for because of those email marketing capabilities. Um, cool. that, that to me seems like a very attractive offering and, and uh, for having a, a first party email marketing solution for, uh, for, for 15 bucks a month or 12 and a half bucks a month seems very compelling. Uh, the other thing that Microsoft announced at their partner conference was some rebranding. So what do you get when you put together EMS E3 or E5 with Office 365 and Windows 10? Well, they used to call that, um, a, uh, they used to call that Secure Productive Enterprise. Now they're calling it off, uh, Microsoft 365. So when you hear the term Microsoft 365, that's the bundle of 
EMS, Office 365, and Windows. So I think of that as a meta bundle because Office 365, of course, is a bundle. So that was that was the other announcement. And then outside of the partner mm -hmm. conference, we had Michael. What did, what did the EMS stand for again? Uh, Enterprise Mobility and Security. Mobility and so that, that yeah. right. So that's that includes Intune, uh, which is your your mobile device management and mobile application management solution. Gotcha. Uh, the and then Stream became generally available, and Forms became available to enterprise clients, uh, enterprise tenants. Um, so let's talk about Stream first. Uh, you, Stream is a video streaming service, uh, but wait, we already had one, Office 365 video. Well, Stream is replacing yep. Office 365 video, and that should have happened seam seamlessly on the back end uh, between now and the end of the year. For those of, of us who have, uh, have channels and things in Office 365 video, those will get converted over to Stream. Um, and Stream being a video solution, um, the, the way they're positioning it is that it gives you great, great search tools for working with video. You can use the video in other applications, uh, embedding it. Uh, it's mobile friendly and enriches your communications. Uh, from a licensing perspective, here's a nice breakdown of, of the capabilities and versus the, the licenses. Uh, so. Your basic viewing capability is available to, to all, your, all your standard licenses, all your standard enterprise licenses and education licenses. Uh, to upload, you need to have at least an E1 license. And then when you get to E5, uh, then you get some really cool features that, that show some of the uh, machine intelligence investments that Microsoft has been making and, and bearing fruit. Uh, the ability to have automatically generated transcripts from your video. so it, so Microsoft will use their machine intelligence capabilities, AI stuff, uh, to automatically generate transcripts from the audio of your video. Uh, they can do in, in they can do detection of faces in video and provide a timeline of where those faces appear in the video. So some some really interesting stuff. Uh, and these yeah, are imagine imagine how yeah. powerful that is when you have a, a ninety minute long video or a whole bunch of them. And you're trying to find out where Mike Blumenthal said such and such, and it can yep. search the transcript, find the video where he said it, and then find the timeline point where he actually said it and take you right there. That's yep. exciting stuff. Exactly, exactly. And again, these are this is uh, an enterprise solution, so it's not available to small business at at least not currently. Uh, Microsoft Forms has actually been around for a while as part of Office 365, but not for commercial tenants. They had built this and released it to the education tenants for maybe over a year. Uh, for, Microsoft Forms uh, is focused on three things, surveys, quizzes, and polls, and then provides analytics on top of that. So when you hear Forms, you need to think of this in, in the context of, of a of, or you want to be specific about what forms you're talking about. In this case, this is Microsoft Forms, which does the surveys, quizzes, and polls, not to be confused with Power Apps, which is a different kind of form solution, or Nintex Forms or InfoPath Forms. This Forms, Microsoft Forms, is just for surveys, quizzes, and polls. And you'll see that Excel surveys is being uh, upgraded into uh, onto this platform as well. Finally, uh, the another piece that, that uh, was uh, updated recently was the help uh, that you find at support.office.com. They, they uh, redid their, their portal here, and now you've got this nice landing page with this banner of product icons um, uh, ac across the middle. Uh, but note that, note the right arrow on there. Let me uh, turn on the laser pointer here this right arrow right here. So that's very important because of course there's so much stuff in um, in Office 365 that it's not just the ones that you see uh, word through through SharePoint, uh, but if you click, you also see that uh, more of the rest of the family and, and there's actually two more icons uh, than what you see here. 
Um, but one of the things I also did with this is I, t I screen clipped the icons and started putting the other nice little summary of what's in the suite because this is a question I run into frequently. I find that people don't realize how much stuff is in Office 365. So this is an attempt to, to summarize that. Uh, but even when you grab all those icons from the new uh, landing pages on, on, uh, on support.office.com um, and you, what is left out is the mobile apps. So one of my favorite mobile apps is Office Lens. And, and that one is one of the mobile ones available from the, from any of the major app stores. Uh, but it's not the only one available from the app stores. There's things like, uh, um, uh, like like Microsoft Authenticator uh, and um, the To Do List one, uh, which is another new one uh, that isn't reflected up here. So uh, there, there's more things to go in here. And if you if you've ever looked at the App Store, if you if you haven't recently looked at any of your mobile app stores for Microsoft apps, definitely worth taking a look at because there's a lot of them and many of them now integrate with Office. Finally, Microsoft released a new video. This is an interview with Mark Cashman. Mark Cashman's uh, a senior product manager at Microsoft focused on SharePoint. He's the gentleman on the left. And um, the uh, and, and he's, ta he's doing this nice uh, summary, which I think is actually kind of end user friendly from the part that I've listened to so far, uh, talking about collaborating using SharePoint and, and to the, the day in the life collaboration story, as well as how SharePoint is now also a, a reinvigorated publishing platform with the arrival of, of uh, communication sites. Side note, communication sites finally hit my tenant here. So, um, and, and it seems like oh, we were at I the tail end of the rollout. Yes? You just said that your your organization got the communication sites. I, I yeah. noticed that MTech didn't get it this week like they were supposed to. Driving me crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'll just show up one day, as all these things do. Um, the the clue is, uh, if you go to SharePoint Home and click on New Site, and instead of having one option, you have two options. It's arrived, and when you go to uh, any of the modern web pages and start dropping web parts on, you suddenly have a lot more choices of web parts, including uh, new page layout options. Um, then they they showed up on Friday. I discovered them Monday morning, um, and yeah, it's it's uh, it's really nice in terms of making well pretty SharePoint pages uh, for for departmental to employee communication, company to employee communication. And now I want to turn it back over to Mark because you've got lots of demos to, that you want to share with us. And uh, so does J uh, Jay has something to share as well. So I'm going to stop sharing and Mark, if you can take the stage. There we go. Hi, thanks a lot. Um, My pleasure. Uh, Jay, do you want me to try to make you a presenter and see if you can run the slides from there or would you want me to just play it on this side? Uh, yeah, if you could just play it on your side. I don't think I have it happening here. All right, I'm going to go and bring it up right now. You're probably, everybody, is, you're going to hear uh, an audio track that runs alongside here. It's about to start, so you're going to hear it in a moment. Um, it's only six slides. It was put together by Jay Champagne. He's a fellow member. It's his first time presenting. It's six slides long. What am I trying to say? To Brian, to Craig, to Dan, to Gilbert, to Jeremy, to Patricia, and to Werner. You guys, everybody can contribute. If there's something that you learned or even a question that you have, this is actually the reason the users group exists. Not just to talk at you, but to let you guys actually collaborate. Let's see what this looks like. I'm going to play it now. In this presentation, I recently started a new job as a web developer for a healthcare provider, and I'm not sure I'll be available or have the input capabilities in order to share with the group. A little about myself. I'm a longtime audio engineer and digital marketer turned Microsoft evangelist. Oh, for some reason it stopped. Hold on. Hello, everyone. Sorry I couldn't participate live in this presentation. I recently started a new job as a web developer for a healthcare provider, and I'm not sure I'll be available or have the input capabilities in order to share with the group. A little about myself. I'm a longtime audio engineer and digital marketer turned Microsoft evangelist and SharePoint administrator. I decided a few years back that I didn't really like dealing with the shadier side of digital marketing, fraud complaints, and service misrepresentations driving down my ROIs, 
So I decided to change gears and learn SharePoint in hopes of facilitating a career change. Presently, I administrate and develop a small on-premises SharePoint and Exchange hosting environment and continue to develop my skill set in the areas of Office 365 administration, web development, and business intelligence. I reached out to Mark regarding any entry of mid-level SharePoint-related work opportunities he might know about, and he graciously offered to allow me to participate in a meetup group to share some tips and prompt discussions of SharePoint usage and best practices. Today, I would like to showcase my recent rideshare service adoption of a SharePoint online list its integration into a mobile-friendly power app, and hopefully get some insights from the community with regards to SharePoint naming conventions. As you can see here, I have a SharePoint custom list I set up to store vehicle mileage log entries and a few details about revenue, time spent driving for either Uber or Lyft rideshare services, as well as a handful of calculated columns that I made with some SharePoint administrators. I decided a few years back that it's really like dealing with the shadier side of digital marketing. It's not auto, it's not auto forwarding guys. Give me a moment while I try to get this back again. Yeah, if you can space bar, that might put us to the next screen. Bring down my ROI, so I change gear. Every time I click it to try to advance it, it's also pausing the playback, hold on. Here's learn SharePoint in hopes of facilitating a career change. Presently, I administrate and develop. Give me one second. I'm going to get this right, everybody. We're somewhere along here. Continue to develop my skill set in the area of Office 365 administration, of SharePoint usage, and best practices. Hey, Jay? Yeah. Everybody can hear you. I'm going to move forward. You're going to talk to the slide yeah, about that. But the small on-premises SharePoint and Exchange hosting environment and continue to develop my All right, go ahead. I've muted my side, so it's your yeah, talking. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so essentially, uh, I was uh, putting together a little uh, ride share work log here where I was logging some information regarding some ride share services and I started playing around with Power Apps, and I noticed that some of my custom list fields had funny encoded characters in some of the field names when I was trying to write some of the formulas to present my data through the app, and I was wondering if other users have <laughs> I hate it when I draw a blank like that, but uh, essentially naming conventions for your custom content types or your list fields or how do you go about naming things so you don't have strange encoded characters or do you not even worry about it? Yeah, I remember you, I actually got a chance to watch the video before it played and what I saw you doing was a very common one, which is um you're going to take all the underscores out of your names when you're defining your content types and your site columns but then you're going to put them back in to try to make it a little bit more readable going forward and one of the questions in today's presentation was what naming conventions are people actually using now i'm going to drive elizabeth crazy and ask her if she can open up all of the audio on everybody most people have probably evolved and I, maybe I should use that word more loosely. They've devolved or they've evolved to using camel case for all of their site columns and their content type names. Just to remove the underscores completely out of the name and certainly all the spaces ends up, mm, I won't say improving the situation as much as it eases and minimizes the pain might be the best way to put it. But what do other people, uh, what have other people found themselves doing for site columns and content types? What naming convention have you guys actually followed? Anybody? This is Michael. Um, in situations where the, the internal name matters, and I don't like to see the, the X0020 in there, which, by the way, is, is simply a, a, a hex representation of space, um, what I'll do when I create a column is create the, create the column uh, with no spaces in the name, and then immediately 
edit the column and rename it with a space because the the underlying internal name is always generated from the name when you create the column and doesn't update when you edit the column. So you can get rid of, you can avoid having it create those, those encoded spaces or encoded other characters if you don't include them in the, when you initially create the column. So even on the slide that everybody's seeing, what you're seeing here for log mileage is a result of having named it with a space, defined it with a space to begin with. It put the space as an encoded character internally, and then you're kind of stuck. You could remove the space uh, on the outside on the display name, but that's not going to actually make, improve your situation. And instead, you're saying, start it off with camel case to begin with. You're going to end up removing the underscore X0020 underscore from the internal name, but you'll be able to put the space back in later on. Do you find yourself using spaces or do you find yourself using underscores at all? Uh, this is Michael. I, I'll use spaces um, for 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 in display names, um, and it's not so much. I wouldn't say it's not, when you when you take the spaces out when you're first creating it. It's not so much you're removing the zero zero two zero. You're preventing them from being created that way. Uh, this is Dan, and I do the same thing that Michael does with things: is to create it either with. Um, no spaces or just a few letters or characters instead of being very long. I'll do it very short, like uh, net fares could be NF. And then I go back and rename it after I create it to being net space fares. That's why th that helps with URLs also that uh, aren't so long. Oh, okay. So as long as you adopt a good naming convention, you end up with really short like let's call them variables you would end up with very short variables that show up in your urls and you never ever suffer any kind of excess excessively long url problems right right because when you when you dive down into sharepoint the urls can get pretty long with all the code that it puts in so if you can uh eliminate some of that the best you can it does help because there's times you want to you, right. you don't hide the link but you send a hyperlink to somebody and when it wraps like five yeah. lines yeah, that can be kind of long. Right. Yeah. And now it sounds like there's a barroom fight breaking out over what's that? What's the other opinion that's out there? Nope. Hey, Dan, thanks for the information. Thanks for the feedback on that. Mike, you too. Anybody else? Any other naming conventions that people have found out are actually useful for site columns and for content type names? We've got camel case with no spaces for definitions, or incredibly short names for definitions with no spaces, followed by going and changing the space, the display name by padding it with spaces and making it more descriptive, more human readable. These are all great suggestions that people can try going forward on their site columns and on their content types. Here's the big question for everybody, Mike, Dan, even myself. Have you ever been able to fix it after you've already made the mistake? In my own experience, if you've accidentally named something and you put the pads in, you don't get to go back and redefine the internal name. It, it's more or less done. You have to basically get rid of it and redefine it right from the get-go uh, because you don't get to override the internal definition once it's been created. Is that your experience, Mike? Or Dan? Yes, that is my experience. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, this yeah. is Dan. It's been mine too. I've had a project that uh, I went and re and changed those names to be more friendly so I could find it. And it blew up. I could never get it working again and had to redo about 14 hours worth of work. Luckily I had notes, so it went faster. But yeah, yeah, I blew yeah. it up. Everybody was, everybody is quiet for a moment. Those of you that have had the exact same moment, we, we just relived the, the very same pain that Dan is just describing, where you're looking and thinking, ah, everybody's got it. Why did Microsoft do this? Why is it so hard to actually override these changes? 17 mm -hmm. years later, there's room for improvement here, I think. Uh, Jay, is there anything else you wanted to add on this particular tip? Uh, no, I actually, I had one question regarding like camel casing. So um, sure. my understanding would be that the first letter would be lowercase, is that something that you usually would stick around or 
would you uppercase maybe the first word? I, I almost want to say it's artistic preference. I use uh, lowercase on function names, things like that, but on variable names like say columns, I tend to start off with a capital letter. Um, I, I use underscores at the very beginning of all of my internal variables for SharePoint designer workflows, but I tend to avoid using a lowercase uh, character as the very first one on a site column. I'll go uppercase. Uh, Dan, what do you do? Do you go strictly camel case or do you start off with lowercase like uh, you know JavaScript functions or sort of format? I'll, I'll do it. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll camel case of yeah. I'll, I'll start at each word with the the capital and then lowercase it out, scrunch out to the the spaces, and then go back and re, re and change it to something else. You know, after get initially created, but yeah, I'll I'll do up, mix upper upper and lowercase. Sure. And this is this is my go and add that if you're actually writing this writing this kind of code in in C sharp, um, I know there's there's uh, tools you can get that that go into that add into Visual Studio, which will um, which will enforce your naming convention rules so that if you if the rule is camel case, then it'll make sure you uppercase or or lowercase the right things, um, and it it'll help you be consistent. I'm not sure what it was those tools available for JavaScript or not? You have to look. I think some of those might actually be available in the new uh, new work chain. So in in uh, Visual Studio Code, I think there's some enforcement that's available. It was one of the the pluses. But all good stuff. This is exactly the kind of things we should be discussing as a users group. So if you guys have some other things that you want to share or even questions, again, Dan, Gilbert, Jeremy, Patricia, Werner, and others that are joining the call. This is what it's all about, is sharing this kind of information, sharing the pain, sharing the insights, and sharing here's how I got myself into this mess, and here's how we got ourselves out of this mess, and it's even a chance to validate with people that are other newbies, with people that have been working with this product for decades. You get a chance to validate even some of the good ideas that you came up with. So, Jay, thanks for the putting forth the effort to create that the, the six slides. I hope it wasn't too taxing. What did you think? Was this painful? Was it, were you, were you phobic about presenting today, or did it turn out all right? Uh, well, everything was actually fairly easy. Uh, I'm always a little nervous to speak in front of the group, but hey, so far, so good. Uh, thanks, everybody, for all your inputs. Good, good. Would you want to do it again? Yeah, and I can't recommend uh, I can't recommend enough uh, the Power Apps. It's, it's quite amazing. So if you haven't had a chance to, to mess around with that, I will definitely recommend it. And, and same with the Power BI. That's got some amazing functionality. Yeah, everybody's seeing it. You're going to, even to the rest of the people attending, you know, we spent uh, almost three months in a row, I think, including uh, Power Apps up early on in the year. And we're diving back in right after that. So expect more Power Apps stuff to happen even in August and even in September. Why? Because that's where Microsoft says is going to be the replacement for InfoPath. is going to be Power Apps for the forms, SharePoint lists, and Flow. So we need to start learning and developing and establishing best practices. And that's part of, again, what, what users groups are all about. All right. All right. Uh, let's well, continue. Uh, Mark, if, can I add something to the, that Power Apps? Uh, can I talk a little bit more about Power Apps as well? Um, so, uh, I had the privilege to attend uh, some uh, a day of Microsoft training on Power Apps, uh, taught by a gentleman. I think his name is John Landgrave, and um, uh, he's got a a, a Yammer network um, that uh, that he's that he runs uh, for talking about Power Apps uh, and and Flow, and, and he really positions this as uh, the the business uh, business application. Uh, programming uh, tools. So um, it, it's these things are, are there to empower citizen development as well. And it's not just about developing uh, mobile apps on SharePoint, but there's a, a something called the Common Database, something or other Common Database Service, I think, um, that uh, that lets you uh, do do storage uh, of of things beyond using SharePoint lists, because SharePoint lists are not good at relational data. Um, 
and and so there's there's so much potential here and i i'm excited to see what other people have done um one of my intents uh, for the next 12 months is to to ramp up on power apps um but it's competing with a lot of other priorities i have so even though i've attended training i've, I've not actually had much chance to, to get my hands dirty in it um but i do have uh, some training materials that that the instructor john landgrave provided and if anyone wants to uh, watch those i'm happy to share them Sure, Mike. In fact, uh, one of the things that's on the horizon for August or September is to dive into Power Apps and take that next step where you've actually developed custom functionality that's going to be available as a service, and then you're going to consume that service oh, using your Power App. And that's what sets the stage for some really amazing stuff to happen using a tool like Power Apps. You get the, the responsive design right out of the box. You get the flexibility right out of the box. And the big question everybody always has is, where do I encapsulate all of that custom business logic and how do I consume it? And it's going to be done through services. So I'll watch for upcoming demos in that area. Uh, it's exciting for me to suddenly to, to realize the, the interest, the, the growing interest this group has in Power Apps. It, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to what we're going to present in August and September. Uh, let's take, a, I've got 15 minutes. I've got two other demos I want to try to get through. I do not think I'm going to get through both of them, but we're going to dive back in and see where we did get. I made a bold brag uh, last month in June that we were going to cover all of these different ones. It turns out communication sites, we have to wait because our organization has not yet got communication sites added into our subscription. Uh, same thing goes for Microsoft Forms, although I will mention briefly, uh, I have one or two slides on it. We'll get a chance to see Microsoft Stream, Possibly we've got get to see Microsoft Planner today. I may push that because we actually have a real hard stop at one o'clock. So let's dive in. Microsoft Communication Sites, what is it? It's SharePoint and WordPress, it's their love child. Uh, everybody's trying to find a way to describe what it is. That's Mark Vogt's expression. It's a WordPress love child inside SharePoint. You can use a regular website template, you fill in the blanks and suddenly you get things that are as groovy looking as WordPress is, but you're delivering it through SharePoint. Nothing could be better. Watch for us to be able to give a demo as soon as that's available. It will be on our agenda. Next thing I want to talk about is Microsoft Forms. It's a simple, lightweight app for creating surveys, quizzes, and polls, just like Michael mentioned. Hey, Mark? There are a few. Yeah. Um, it, not, it, it, I don't know if this is throwing curveball in, but um, I, I, uh, I stood up, I took a communication, communication site and stood up a very basic demo site using it. Um, and I can I can show that if you're interested either before well before or after your 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 demo if you'd like if there's time or we can save it till next okay. month. Yeah, we may end up having to save it to next month just so we can get through at least one of the other demos. I'm looking at 12:48. That means we already know as a T as a as a user group session some of the things are going to be popping up. It's going to be the Power Apps focused and it's going to be the communication sites. So yeah, if you don't mind, let's wait until the next session, okay? And let me go ahead. Fantastic. Um, talking a little bit about forms, you'll see some slides here. If you first come into Microsoft Forms, and everything in Office 365 is a new platform. So you're going to see a new vanity host name. You're going to see forms.microsoft.com. You're going to see stream.microsoft.com. You're going to see planner or tasks.microsoft.com is going to be the naming convention you see going forward. When you go to forms.microsoft.com, you're going to see a splash page here. If your organization has not yet had it available, you're going to see something that looks like this. If not, if you are enabled, you're going to immediately start seeing a bunch of forms that have already been made available to your organization. When you go into an editor, you're going to be able to see what looks like a very easy to put together monkey-like survey um, where you get to add different kinds of fields, different kinds of questions, what kind of results that there are. Ultimately, your users are going to see something that just looks like an ordinary worksheet that they're filling out, whether they're students, whether they're employees, whether they're trainees in a training session, something like this. Um, lastly, when they fill all of that information out, you'll end up with some pretty good online analytics that I'm told can also be seen inside Power BI. So it's a great way to get immediate feedback for the students themselves or the, the people that are taking the survey, the poll, the quiz, but also there's some great analytics that come out of those you might actually see us experimenting with this as a users group. We got the poll functionality available in Meetup, 
this would potentially replace it. So don't be surprised if in the next month you actually see us experimenting and using you guys as our 239 guinea pigs to go ahead and take a peek at this. What I thought was interesting was that it's both authenticated and anonymous public surveys are possible, although it is limited to around 5,000 entries per form. They go out of their way in the documentation to say this is not a replacement for InvoPath, nor will it ever be. It's meant to serve a very specific niche market trying to get into education, which I think is a really savvy move by Microsoft. So that's a little bit about forms, and when it is available, you'll see a bigger demo. We'll actually build a form, build a survey, things like that. Uh, we have to save it for another time. Um, one last note about forms, though, is that if you were to try to compare this to the existing InfoPath functionality, really what InfoPath delivers is storing data, handling events, and presenting some kind of UI UX that's compelling, collapsing fields or sections, repeating sections, etc. In the current version of business solutions, you're using SharePoint lists and libraries, InfoPath and InfoPath, and maybe it's because of all, after all these years we're used to InfoPath, but it ends up being rather easy. I see it being challenging for Microsoft to actually provide the functionality we all demand with the current version of Microsoft Flow and even some of the current versions of Power Apps. It's got to get more stable, faster. It's got to be more robust, faster, where you don't accidentally lose an entire page or even lose an entire app. These things are possible. I've had it happen to me and it drives me nuts. Uh, if they can solve that problem, then I am a huge proponent of Power Apps because I get to build mobile apps with it. And like Jay was saying, the minute you start saying, I'm building mobile apps, uh, that is the ultimate propeller to be spinning on your little propeller hat when you're an IT consultant. Um, let's take a look at Microsoft Streaming, and I think that's going to be it for today. What is Microsoft Stream? It's an enterprise-level secure video service. It's uploading, viewing, and sharing videos securely worldwide, tapping into Microsoft's content delivery network, which underneath the hood is actually probably a lot of different content delivery networks, but it all is abstracted beautifully, wonderfully away from you. It plays very well with Microsoft Teams, SharePoint, and all of the other apps, OneNote, Yammer, you name it. It includes comments, tags, discussions. There are channels that provide a way to organize the content. There are groups that actually provide the security for that content. All you have to do is use a browser. It's available now. It's even available for us. And we get to dive into a demo. Let me show you what you're going to get first, though. In the upper right-hand corner of any Office 365, you'll click the 3 by 3 grid, the app launcher, and you'll actually see Stream is a new tile that's going to be available, a new Office 365 app that's available. The minute you click on it, you're going to be treated to a little intro page that lets you get started. And once you get started, if you already have a login, you'll get this cool looking black screen that lets you choose your videos, your channels, your groups, etc. Or you can actually upload videos, create a new channel, create a new group. And like I mentioned earlier, channels are going to organize your content. So those are themes. The groups are going to be groups where you organize who gets to see what. And you end up with a really sexy, there's no other way to say it, a really sexy splash page for your organization that helps you keep track of newly uploaded stuff, stuff that's streaming or trending, popular videos, the latest videos. This is a very nice looking interface and it's completely responsive. Once you start uploading, you're going to choose the channel that you want to upload to. You're, there's going to be a dialog box for picking a file. You're going to fill in some metadata. You ultimately get to post it and then you end up seeing the actual document. And let's see if I can dovetail in and make this happen. Um, let's see. I'm going to bring this over. Tell me when you can see my browser. I can see your browser. Okay, we're going to get rid of a few pages. We're going to go into my uh, MTEX Office 365 environment. <laughs> Excuse me. It's chewing and getting into the landing page for Microsoft Online. Looks like everybody else's page. It's whatever you make for a splash. But what's down here in the app launcher is, where did it go? I'm not seeing stream listed here. It was here just a second ago. We'll cheat and we'll actually say stream.microsoft. Dot com. This happens with Power Apps once in a while, too. The tile just goes missing. 
And if I want to get started, I'll say sign in. I get it's a brand new platform, so you kind of shifted to like a sub cloud in the Microsoft cloud. And here's where I can actually see all of the other stuff that's been recently trending, things like that. And it actually does pretty good. I get about 30 to about 50 megabytes per minute of upload, and it, it seems to look good. Let's see what it's like when I want to go and add a new, I'll add a new channel and I'll try posting to that particular channel. We'll call, we'll call it UAV stuff. And we won't add any more on here. It's only going to be a company-wide channel. So I'm creating sort of a bucket in which to put everything. There's no videos to display right now, but I'm going to say my content. Let's look at my videos. Here's one video that's already there that I can go and later add in. And here's where I can actually select a new file to upload. I'm going to have to try to find something that's fairly small. Let me see if I can go get it. is always the hard part in a demo like this. Got to find the small one. Ah. Here's one that, there's a very small one. It's gonna go get it. I get to fill in all the metadata about a name, a description, a language, it starts processing. Here's where I get to choose the people that are allowed to see it by naming either groups or naming individual people. And here's where I get to put anything else on, like am I going to allow people to make contents on it, things like this. So as soon as I fill in all of the details that are required here, this is gonna actually start uh, uploading this document for me, uploading this uh, video for me. I fill in the permissions. If I say publish now, we'll just take it as is. You'll see that this has already been added then into streams, it becomes a part of Microsoft's overall content delivery network and is available for me to selectively share with people. It's basically YouTube for your corporation. In fact, it's YouTube with some additional steroids. So it's one that Michael uh, mentioned very early in today's session, that if you have the proper subscription, even the audio is going to be transcribed and you can then index that transcription to be able to find content based, video content based on words, but even tell you exactly where in the timeline you need to go and look. There's not a lot exciting about going and uploading stuff. Let's go back and look at my videos and you'll see, there must have been some clouds that I was looking at. But there you can see that we've uploaded some videos. I'm wondering what this is. Oh, I, I think I was just uh, looking at some clouds that were going on here. But uh, you can see that Microsoft is loaded for bear. They're trying to create an environment where corporations have the ability to share content securely, training, discussions, webinars, corporate uh, presentations, stuff like that, all in a secure fashion without having to go to Google, without having to go to YouTube to do it. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of exciting stuff going on inside there. Let's jump back into my normal presentation and talk about what's going to happen next week. We're going to talk about Microsoft Planner. We're going to talk about communication sites, Teams, and Power Apps. And I think that's it. Thanks, everybody. We're trying really to keep the time today. We ended up with one minute early. Thanks very much to Michael Blumenthal, per usual, for the excellent words on Office 365 news and events. And uh, Jay, nicely done. Thanks for the, the first presentation from another regular member. I look forward to seeing more of them. Thank you. All right, that's it, everybody. Have a fantastic day, and we'll see you next. We'll see you in August for the August session. You too. Thank you.